very much, Anna, and um, it's been a huge pleasure um, to work with you. Yes, Mummy! Um, <laughs> 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 um, it's been a huge pleasure to work with you over the last few years, both here and here in Oxford. And um, you've, been, you've been so much to autism research, and I'm absolutely delighted to be able to hand it over to you as director, as I'm sure everyone else is doing. Um, friends and, and colleagues and supporters here today, thank you. Um, I want to start today's talk, if I may, by going right back to the beginning of my academic career. Mommy. And some of you all know, I'm Australian, I have a two-year-old too. Um, I, I'm Australian and I began um, as a PhD student and training educational psychologist at the University of Western Australia. Like many of us, I started off my career in psychology wanting to make a difference to others, wanting to help others, particularly those who needed extra support. And again, like many of us, my first experience of autism began in a textbook, researchers and clinicians describing the puzzle or enigma of autism, which, as a student and young researcher, absolutely fascinated me. And so I delved more and more into textbooks and journals, mesmerised by researchers and attempts to understand autism, their attempts to know autism. And in doing so, I got really excited by and stuck into the nitty gritty of abstract notions like theory of mind and central coherence. Um, and eventually trying to test the veracity of these claims, the or truth of these theories and their claims. These theories, however, always fell short of explaining autism, at least in my data set. This was hugely disappointing, of course, as a researcher. But for other reasons, this was beginning to be not so surprising. Before I started my PhD, I began working with a little boy who was autistic and his family. The, the, um, Jay, his name, he had a few words, he only had a few words at the time, and he didn't have, you know, he didn't put them together to make phrases. And so I worked with him one day a week on language activities to try and improve his speech and communication. And I was just totally inspired by him and his family. They taught me a lot about support, about resilience, about empathy, and about the reality of autism. And so I came to see that these textbook notions that I was studying struggled to fully understand or explain autism, because they don't situate autism in context. That is, that these people, like all of us, have particular histories that are rooted in and therefore affected by the context in which people live, in which they grow up, within a family, a school, a community, society. Through working with this family and other people and through my research over the years, I've become convinced that knowing autism requires much more than textbook descriptions and abstract concepts, to which I admittedly often refer. It requires listening, learning, and involving autistic people and their families in research. Truly knowing autism requires both objective and subjective understandings, experience, and expertise. And that's my argument today. I want to draw on all the work that we've done at Cray over the last few years in order to try and convince even the most skeptical of you that scientific research needs to change if we're going to do what we claim to do and to properly learn about autism. So it's a complex task I've set myself for tonight. Um, so I'm going to try and keep the structure as clear as possible for my sake as much as yours. I want to start, so this is part one, by talking about the explosion um, the scientific research that we've seen over the past decade in autism and ask where it's helped us. I'll make a case for the need for more applied research, which raises the question in part two. Um, whether there is still then a case for what we call basic science or, or, or lab-based um, lab or uh, less applied research. Of course, the answer will be yes, but perhaps not in the way that we expect. Then in part three, I want to make my own concrete argument. I'll outline three ways in which we actually know autism better than orthodox science might allow. And that's when our research goes from lab to community and back again. 
when community involvement challenges our perceptions and our misperceptions of the data we collect, and when we bring together experts and experts by experience. I'll conclude by suggesting that working together with community members in research, community members as scholars, as co-researchers, as advisors, as supporters, is necessary for truly knowing what is Okay, so let me start in a place um, at which many of you will have heard me speak before on the explosion of scientific research in the past decade and the uses to which it has and has not been put. So this graph comes from an analysis of PubMed, which is a database that houses millions of publications um, in the biomedical literature. And I just did a rough search um, for the term autism. Um, and I also do rough searches for the term ADHD, developmental coordination disorder, or dyspraxia, and specific language impairment. And so you've got the number of publications on this axis, and you've got dates, time on, the, on this axis, from 1946 actually to 2016, that's the last century. Um, what I want you to focus on is the uh, dark pink line, which doesn't look so pink, but the one that goes up. <laughs> um, that's the case of autism publications. Um, and what I hope you can see is that when we hit the year around 2000, um, there are fewer than 500 publications on autism every year, and, and, and fewer than that in the, in the early years. And from then on, there's this exponential surge, such that in 2016, which is the final entry, we have more than 3,500 publications on autism. And what I also hope you can see is that this growth far surpasses growth in other fervent areas like ADHD, um, which is the kind of second, um, the, the light purple line. Um, and even, you know, and, and definitely surpasses um, the growth, there's a little bit of growth in, um, in DCD and SLI research, but not so much. Um, so there's a lot of research going on, there's a huge amount of research going on. So much so that it's prompted a lot of discussion, including by the anonymous blogger Neuroskeptic, who wrote a blog in 2013 headed, Are We Heading for Autism? Indeed, with all of this knowledge being produced on autism, one would think that all of this research should make a profound difference to people's lives. But does it? Not necessarily. More scientific research does not automatically yield improvements in people's lives. And I think that's because of the choices that have been made regarding who, what gets researched and what doesn't. In 2010, I had the privilege of working on a project with Tony Charman. We set out to look at just that. We looked at how much had been spent on autism research in the UK in the past five years and what it had been spent on. And we consulted with more than 1,700 autistic people, their family members, practitioners and researchers to understand what they thought of current autism research and where they thought the funds should be prioritised in the future. Our report acknowledged you know, the many great strengths of autism research in the UK, stretching from the amazing and inspiring early work of Sir Michael Butter to Uta Fruit and Francesca Cafe. But it also noted considerable challenges in the years to come. While autistic people and their family members were impressed by the quality of British autism research, they were not convinced that research, this research made a, a difference to their lives. And so one woman said, you know, I fill in all these questionnaires and do everything I can to help, but when it comes down to it, it's not real life. It's always missing the next step. It's great you've done the research, you've listened to my views, but now do something with it. Too many people feel that there's a huge gap between knowledge and practice. Research doesn't seem to help the young autistic people learn to catch the bus by themselves or to keep themselves safe. And it doesn't say how to help autistic adults get themselves into a job and keep themselves there. Our participants wanted to see real changes for themselves, their child, or the person with whom they work. They thought British academics were not taking enough notice of real life issues. And they were right. Our analysis showed that the majority of UK autism research focused heavily on what's called basic science, neural and cognitive systems, genetics, and other risk factors. 
rather than on research targeting the immediate circumstances in which autistic people find themselves, on services, treatments, interventions, and education. In fact, our report showed that only 5% of research funding between 2007 and 2011 went towards identifying effective services for autistic people and their family. Only 5%. Autistic adults and parents and autistic children you know, said to us they valued the need for basic scientific research to understand better you know, autism's underlying causes because we simply don't know enough. But they wanted a more balanced profile, valuing research the direct impact on the daily lives of autistic people as well as researching the core areas of basic science. Not only did we find that research was lacking in these specific areas, we also showed that certain populations of individuals were being underserved. That's the adults, the older adults, and girls and women. Both the lack of research on real life issues and the lack of translation of existing research into practice um, you know, it generates very, very serious problems. Problems for those responsible for commissioning local autism services and problems for people working in those services, and problems for autistic individuals and their families as they attempt to make evidence-based decisions on education, health, and social care. Now, one plausible reason for this disconnect between um, what gets researched and what people want to be researched focuses on the decision-making processes around research. So research priorities are ordinarily set <laughs> almost exclusively by scientific funders and academics and specialist fields. Autistic people, their family members, and even practitioners are very rarely involved in the decision-making processes that shape research and its applications. They are rarely involved beyond being passive participants in subjects in research. And, 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 and as we know from our own work, that lack of involvement results in feelings of disenfranchisement. Indeed, in a focus group that I ran for this study, one autistic adult rather skeptically asked me, whatever we say, is it really going to influence people? That's a very sorry statement. Involving community members, so autistic people, their family members, and those who support them in research should be an essential part of what we do as autistic researchers. It should make our research more relevant to people's everyday lives, more tailored to their individual needs, and more consistent with their values. Now, I've been talking about these findings, and this means the community involvement in research all over the world, from the US to Denmark to Australia to Spain for the past five years. And I usually get a very positive response from them. It clearly resonates with people who are having similar experiences wherever you go. But I wouldn't be being honest if I didn't acknowledge that there has been a somewhat more critical response, <coughs> including from people that I admire greatly. So in preparing for this talk, I've been reflective on the counter-arguments, the reasons to be worried about community involvement in research, the people who don't agree, and why they don't agree. And in this second part of the talk, I'm going to tackle some of these challenges, including the preeminence of basic science. So most researchers, at least in our acute made together research, were convinced, just like community members, that we need more applied research in areas of services, supports, interventions, and education. Very few people dispute that we need more research to enhance the well-being and lives of people and their families. There's no doubt about that. But many scientists have argued to me over the years that there should be a clear division of labour, with some researchers concerned with you know, service design, education and the like, but others who are concerned with so-called basic science. And people have said that my mistake is being to kind of mix up the two. So the hard scientists, the geneticists, the neuroscientists, the neurobiologists, the cognitive scientists, aren't trained to do that more applied research. So the other goes. And so need to be allowed to get on with doing that hard science, doing what they're actually expert in. And it goes further than that too. 
So some scientists are very wary about getting autistic people and their allies involved in different parts of the research, scientific research process. Scientific research, that reminds me, is prized for being impartial, falsifiable, and rigorous. For some, the very involvement of people with a vested interest potentially introduces a bias into the scientific method. And for good reasons, people don't want to mess with that. They feel that the people making judgments about research or research funding have to be other scientists. That people with autism in their families may not be the appropriate people to decide where research funding should be allocated. And the involvement of people with autism in their families in dialogue about funding risks politicising a scientific issue. The last point is actually really in the news at the moment. So one potential problem or challenge with involving parents and autistic people and other stakeholders is that it implausibly places every participant on an equal footing. And the Vaccine Autism Bureau is one example of the difficulties that result from such an approach. On the one hand, we've got scientific evidence that overwhelmingly suggests that vaccines do not cause autism. And on the other hand, we still have widespread doubt about vaccine safety, including from the President of the United States. <laughs> An increasing number of people seem to simply dismiss the advice of scientific experts on various topics, from vaccinations to climate change. And in the era of fake news and post-truth, it's not surprising that many scientists are not keen to share their research platforms with non-scientists, even from the um, autistic and um, autism communities. And just to reinforce this point, you may remember during the Brexit campaign before the referendum, when Michael Gove said, People in this country have had enough of experts. Here we have um, in the commentary box here, um, Nobel Prize winner, president of the Royal Society, Sir Paul Nurse, commenting on Michael Gove's um, comments. Um, and he says, the fact that experts have been divided in this way does have an effect on undermining science and scientific evidence. So Paul said that the British public still has high levels of trust in scientists, but we are living in a period where opinion is on the front of those who are experts, who have the knowledge, who have the intellectual ability to dissect these difficult problems, are being derided and pushed back. Science is built to last. Opinion, opinions are not built to last. So scientists resistance to involve some scientists resistance to involve our community members in research, particularly in basic hard science, are therefore understandable in the era of Donald Trump. Um, Brexit and the attack on truth. It's understandable that scientists want to protect the integrity of their work. It just as the surgeon shouldn't operate on their own child, you know, the autism and autistic community shouldn't be trying to mess with the scientific method. Or so the case goes. So on these arguments, one could say that we need to be more attentive to real life issues in autism research. We need to be doing more practical research because it is the right thing to do. It's the most ethical thing to do. We still need basic autism science because we need to know more about autism. But for this aspect of research, we need to be wary of community involvement for the very reasons I've described. So this is all very compelling and a painful thing. But it misses something. It misses something very important. Basic scientists are on a quest to understand at whatever level at which they're operating, they're on a quest to know autism. And what I want to argue in the remainder of my talk is that it is not possible to know autism without the involvement of actually autistic people and their allies in whatever research we're doing. Scientific investigation and community involvement are not at odds with each other. They are vital components of the same thing. So we get to the third part of my talk. And here, I'm going to outline three ways in which we can and will actually know autism effects at this pattern. The first is 
is about is getting research from the lab to the community and back again. So this getting getting research from the lab to the community is called translational research, in which the goal is to translate discoveries from basic science into benefits for human health in the real world. Um, taking research as the medics say from bench to bench time. It thus has a key role to play in improving our lives. But going in one direction, from lab to community, is not enough. In order to understand what's really going on, we also need to encourage backwards or reverse translation, with knowledge from the community stretching back into the lab. The translational pipeline that you see here shouldn't just go in one direction, it also needs to go in reverse. The idea here is that the initial research itself will be more successful when the researchers listen to and learn from autistic people and their allies in their own context. Just think about how the research agenda is set normally. Too often at the moment, it depends on the you know, scientists talking to other scientists, reading journal articles, writing funding bids, and identifying research questions that way. Think how much richer and more complex the research agenda might be if these researchers actually listen to autistic people, their family members, clinicians, their students. Those who aren't trained as scientists might at least occasionally spot issues that need investigation. And I'm going to give you an example from some research that we've recently done at Craig that illustrates how scientists might miss something worth investigating unless they listen in the way that I've described. And my example comes from uh, mental health or anxiety in autism. So we know that mental health problems are extremely common, which is a particularly depression and anxiety. And scientists rightly want to know, in the case of anxiety, what causes anxiety in autistic people, and whether anxiety for autistic people differs from anxiety in normal autistic and in starting to examine this question, researchers were trying to distinguish between symptoms of anxiety similar to those seen in neurotypical adults, what we call that called traditional anxiety, so everyday worries that are difficult to control or irritability, um, and what they call autism specific signs of anxiety, or atypical anxiety, which is exacerbated and severe anxiety linked to the key features of autism. And in doing so, they presumed that the causes of anxiety must lie fundamentally with the person themselves, or with specific features of autism. Now some research I've done this year has made me think twice about investigating anxiety in autism in this way. And that's because I've had the privilege to be involved in the Know Your Normal project with Laura Crane, a fantastic group of young autistic adults, and my voice volunteers, Fern Adams, Georgia Harper, and Jack Welch from Anisha Scarlett. They partnered with us on a, on a piece of genuinely co-produced research, such that Fern, Georgia, and Jack were involved in the research at every step of the way, designing the questionnaire and interview questions, analyzing and interpreting the data, and helping to write up the report. And we sought the views of more than 100 young autistic adults aged between 16 and 25 years about how they felt about their mental health issues, how they identified whether they had mental health problems, and who they turned to for support. The results, and I urge you to read the report, are rather disheartening, with many young autistic people struggling to evaluate their own mental health effectively and struggling to identify the right kind of support but what is important for the point I'm making here is that the way autistic people understood their own anxiety did not reflect the research agenda that scientists have largely followed up to now. Autistic people, that is, did not tend to locate the root causes of their anxiety in autism itself. Rather, many suggest that their anxiety emerged from the often hostile experience of other people's interactions with them. Which this quote, um, quote very clearly describes. This is young, one young um, adult who said, the reason that so many people with autism development with health conditions is the way we are treated. From early childhood, 
autistic youth are excluded, frowned upon, and made to feel unnatural. We are constantly pressured to be more normal, whatever that means. I think that if someone who wasn't autistic grew up being excluded, bullied, and pressured to be something that they are not, they would very, less, very likely develop the same conditions. Um, the source of the, the anxiety for this and many other individuals lies with others, others' perceptions, others' actions. If they're right, then it is precisely these experiences that we need to be learning from if we want to understand the nature of anxiety. So if we want to shape an adequate research agenda when it comes to the question of mental health in autism, it's clearly best to start with the experiences of the autistic people themselves. And that's the first of my three ways to actually know autism better. By doing backwards translation, starting with the community, listening to and learning from autistic people and their allies at the beginning and throughout the research process. Yeah. <laughs> But the benefits of community engagement for scientific understanding of autism do not stop there. The second way to know autism best is to have community involvement to challenge our perceptions or our misperceptions as we analyse the data that we collect and the research that we do. And here I've been very much inspired by the work of Michelle Dawson, who's an autistic scientist at the University of Montreal. It was Michelle who first pointed out that there are a whole host of research findings which find that autistic people are good at something, better than non-autistic people, but they have tended to be presented by scientists as somehow revealing a problem. Data which in fact reveal strengths are often interpreted in a negative way, as a deficit or as an impairment. Here, Jean Laurent was on right. Autistics like non-autistics, have genuine difficulties in many areas, and like non-autistics, require assistance in areas where they're performative. But autistics uniquely are seen as pathological when displaying significant or dramatic strengths, creating for autistics a nearly insurmountable disadvantage or disability not faced by non-autistics. So scientists are misinterpreting the data in front of them because they're not listening hard enough. Experience. And here's one example. And again, initially talked about by Michelle. Um, so these colleagues, Denko and um, et al., um, recorded children's <coughs> laughter during a series of playful interactions in an experimenter. And then they, 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 they then went away and analysed the laughter acoustically. And they showed that autistic children <coughs> only one type of laughter, or they could real or voice laughter. Whereas typical children exhibited two types of laughter, real or voice laughter, and fake or unvoiced laughter. So an example of fake laughter is when you know, someone's telling you a joke and it's not really very funny, but you kind of feel like you have to go, that would be fake. Um, so it was, it was a typical piece that showed both real and fake. Um, and the authors concluded autistic children are not using laughter in a socially subtle manner which actually contributes to the social deficits exhibited by children with autism instead of serving to facilitate connections with others. Now I'm not necessarily knocking this study because actually I think it's a very interesting research. Um, but as Michelle points out, the way in which the apparent strength of autistic children, that they were genuine in their social response, was misdescribed as a result of their social deficits, is actually deeply concerning. Laughing because you really think something is funny, rather than because you want someone to think you did, is presented as a problem. And that's a good thing. Now I'm going to give you one more example of misdescribing data because of failing to listen to autistic people. And this time this comes from my own work. So my colleagues and I were interested in what we call adaptation. Fundamental property of sensory systems, which is basically a form of plasticity in which our current sensory experience is intimately affected by what we see around us. And over numerous experiments, we've shown that autistic children show less adaptation to sensory stimuli than neurotypical children. That is, they don't, they don't adapt or get used to stimuli 
is readily which I'm afraid I've not described as abnormal adaptive mechanisms. Let me give you an example of an adaptation task so that you know what I mean. So this task measures number adaptation. Uh, so I don't get you to do this. You might not work in all cases. So bear with me. But what I want you to do is stare at the red dot for about 30 seconds. So let's always do stare at the red dot. Watch the red dot. Autistic 
people might even be more adept than neurotypical people in reading the minds of those who are autistic because they're better able to understand the different feelings, thoughts, and assumptions of those who are autistic. And supporting this is a wonderful quote from one an autistic man in one of our recent studies who says, I can walk past a hundred people and I will see this one person and be like, that, that one person has autism. So that's a good advantage for me. If you have autism, you can have a really good understanding of other people with All of this suggests that a fundamental problem in non-autistic researchers' quest to know autism and stresses the need for autistic involvement in that quest. So I've talked about two, um, um, two of the three ways that we can actually know autism better. Going from that to community and back again. And from ensuring that in community involvement in what efforts or challenges our perceptions and our misperceptions of the data we have in the week. The final way builds on this to suggest that we need to bring together what we might call expertise. Sorry, experts. Um, what we might call experts by experience. The great 18th century philosopher G.S.W. Hegel said that if we want to understand anything, we need to understand it both from the outside and from the inside. So if you want to know what London is, for example, it's good to look at it from a distance. Maybe from an aerial photograph. But it's also good to experience, directly, experience it directly or to talk to those people who do. The people who take the tube every day people who jostle up and down Oxford Street, who put up with the rain, who complain about the rain. And the same goes for autism. If you want to try and get as close as we can to an understanding of autism, we need to try to grasp the crucial, crucial subjective experiences of autism, the particularities of autism, as well as the objective scientific facts. And here's the third reason. Um, that, sorry, that's the third reason why if we care about understanding autism, then we must involve those with experiential expertise in research. This means that we actually need to appreciate the difference between different people's experience um, based expertise. So scientists' knowledge is represented by empirical observation, theoretical argumentation, and ultimately objective truths. Parents have unique experience about the child's development, the type of support they might need, and actually autistic people might have direct experience of what it's like to be autistic and how they negotiate their everyday lives. Each of these communities therefore has what Collins and Evans have described or called experience-based experiences. Now this might seem really obvious, but it's still so rare studies of autism to combine these two elements. But let me show you what happens in the I want to take an example of this from my own work as a long-term outcome study. So, you know, it's well known that, you know, from the, from the few longitudinal studies that, that have been done, they've repeatedly shown that the long-term outcomes of autistic adults are rather bleak. Few people have jobs, few live independently, and few have rich social networks. <coughs> Yet these studies have almost, are almost exclusively focused on neurotypical defined norms of what a good outcome is for an autistic person, and they've almost entirely deployed methods that are good for testing objective psychological factors that are very poor at actually discovering how autistic people are experiencing their own lives. I started off doing my longitudinal study in a standard way. My research published back in 2010 focused entirely on what I detected from my analysis of a battery of psychological tasks and included not one word of reflection from the autistic participants themselves or their parents. So this time round, and many years later, I've looked at both objective and subjective experiences. There are many findings from this study that have completely blown me away. But one in particular is that our young autistic adults tell me that they value deep and sustainable relationships and 
connections with others in a way that I couldn't simply detect from the experimental tasks alone. They very clearly articulated their desire for quality, not quantity, friendships with family members and friends. So in terms of family members, they said, you know, my parents have been unbelievably supportive. I always ask my sister for advice. My grandmother was probably my most important teacher. They value those friendships even when they found it sorry, difficult to maintain friendships. So one person says, you know, my closer friends, I feel they definitely understand me in school that matters. But another said, you know, I'm sad about leaving school because I may never see my friends I've made over the years. And another young person said, I'm worried about them just forgetting about me. Indeed, according to several young people, they found it difficult to maintain friendships with their neurotypical peers because unlike them, they were not interested in sex, drugs, and party. But having fewer friends did not mean that they did not value those connections. It just mean, meant that they had smaller social networks, closer friendships, um, as they report, and relied more on the emotional support from their family. Again, these findings might seem too obvious to the non-researchers in the room, but these data, this subjective knowledge, flies in the face of many current conceptions of autism that are popular in scientific circles, which suggest, you know, at the, at the, at the most extreme, that autistic people are striving for lives of their isolation. <laughs> and evidence of these connections is not just seen in more cognitively able or intellectually able individuals. We had the same results um, when we looked at the experiences of autistic children and young people living in residential special schools in England, many of whom had additional intellectual difficulties and limited spoken, very limited spoken communication. Both their parents and the staff supporting them highlighted how much they valued stable, trusting relationships, just like any child. So one um, uh, parent says, you know, there's, 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 there's certain staff who's been bonded with over the years. He's a key worker now, she's been with him since he started. And they've got a fantastic bond between the two of them. Another parent described the effects, the implications of being the bonds can have, um, particularly when there's a change in the support worker. So she was describing that this change for her son, he's gone downhill. He came home not speaking or withdrawn, not the happy go lucky boy that I've seen previously. And staff also noted um, that they, you know, to discuss in focus groups, you know, that's why they sometimes felt like proud parents when the young people want, want you to be part of their lives. When they come and share their little moments with you, their sad moments and their happy moments. Autistic people want to feel valued. They want deep and trusting relationships with others. The subjective, the subjective data from you know, these studies isn't just helpful knowledge. It's fundamental to our understanding of what autism is. It challenges core and objective beliefs about what autism is. So, those are the three ways in, the, in which I think we can actually know autism better. Understanding or knowing autism must combine orthodox scientific endeavour with three new efforts to reach beyond standard boundaries. Moving from lab to community, crucially that began. Always challenging our perceptions or our misperceptions of the data we collect. And constantly listening to and learning from experts by experience. This evening I've made an argument. I suggested that involving autistic people and their allies in research is important not just because it's the right thing to do, but because their subjective understanding, their experiential expertise is necessary for knowing autism. We can't just know autism in the abstract in terms of scientific theory, data, textbook descriptions. We must also know it in particular, the reality. The fundamental underpinnings of this argument aren't, of course, new. You can go all the way back to the ancient Greeks and all of it. Um, so since the dawn of reflections on science, people have been talking about the distinction between the general, the universal, the abstract, the objective, on the one hand, 
and the particular, the subjective, the everyday on the other, both of which are essential for the question. Aristotle talked about phronesis, practical wisdom, those pieces of knowledge that are uncodifiable because they're so deeply connected to the particular, the everyday reality, rather than the general and the more abstract. And scholars, especially here at the IOE, have been making similar arguments in other domains for many of the last decades. But when talking about autism, we've largely missed out. But not for much longer. Because the case I've made tonight is increasingly shared across the world. There are some exciting changes of thought in autism science. We've been seeing some amazing activism from autistic sub advocates in the, in the UK and in the US who are making their voices heard. The most recent one that I'm particularly pleased about has been to get the journal Autism, which I'm the editor, to change their branding by getting rid of the puzzle piece. I think it's fantastic. We've also been working with autistic and neurotypical scholars and artists to put together a starter pack for doing participants autism search, available freely to download for any of those things to get started. Damien Milton and others have set up the Participatory Autism Research Collective, or PARC, to bring, to bring autistic people, including scholars and activists, together with early career researchers and practitioners who work with autistic people. They're aiming to build a community network where those who wish to see more significant involvement of autistic people in autism research <laughs> and we have Autistic and Discover, the, very, the first national network for autism research, connecting researchers with autistic people, families, and professionals. John and James' mission to involve the autistic and autism communities at the heart of what they do is a huge step forward and a massive example to follow. Wherever you look now, it seems the truth of this slide is increasingly acknowledged. We'll learn more, we'll understand more, we'll know more once we put lived experience and research experience together. <coughs> so that almost brings me to my close. And as I end, I'm brought back to where I started. I'm sure all of you in this room tonight either are autistic or you are deeply familiar with the are. And I'm sure all of you know, will know what I mean when I say that I've been dedicating my life to the search for autism has been a huge privilege, an enormous privilege. <laughs> in all of the years here at Cray and in Bristol and Oxford before that, I have learned more than I would have ever thought was possible when I was just starting out. Much of that, of course, has come from the experiments, the journal articles, the conference, the seminars, the PhD students. But it has also come from the immense generosity shown to me, being able to listen to what people have told me about their own lives, their joys and challenges, their difficult moments, and their triumphs. Like Jay here, which is the little boy I worked with all those years ago, now all grown up, state basketball player, finishing school and moving on up into adulthood. As I now leave London to move back to Australia, I know it's those conversations I will remember, and I hope it's those lessons that I've learned. <laughs>